because of COVID, there was a very, very big delay. All my peers, they got delayed and it wasn't the ideal situation for me. So there's another two years to go and you will be a doctor. Yeah, I can't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's such yeah. a great it's such a great thing to work towards and um being a a doctor in your field and putting so much time and effort into your studies mm. the next thing is to be considered to be able to work in the field that you've spent so long studying and it's silly that you're allowed to do all this study work towards your doctorate and become a doctor in your field and then not be able to work in the field that you are highly qualified to work in. Yeah, um, just forget. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 201 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. The previous episode was a great milestone and I hope that this episode is the beginning of the road to the next 100 where the stroke survivor gets to share their story on the road to recovery after stroke and supporters of stroke survivors, be they caregivers or professionals from the medical and rehabilitation fields can also get on the podcast and share the role that they play in this space and how they support stroke survivors. Now, my guest today is Jerusa Mathers, who is on a mission to change the way people with disabilities are treated in the medical field by prospective employers. Highly qualified, Jerusa feels as though she is being discriminated against when it comes to gaining employment in her chosen field, and she is taking the fight all the way to the highest court of the land. So I really appreciate you reaching out and sending me the email. No worries, thank you for having me today, yeah. You're welcome. And I, I, I don't know, I didn't know how to help you. I didn't know how to support your cause. Uh, but I really appreciate your cause because your cause, if I'm correct, if I understood correct, is to raise awareness about discrimination for people such as yourself who are quite capable of uh being involved and being employed in the medical field but are often yeah. I, often are overlooked is that correct yeah definitely and um, there's a lot of discrimination there's a lot of bullying and harassment in in the medical field and that's what i am talking about changing and um, um, just raising awareness about and yeah, um, yeah. So I personally have had a long journey with this so it's been really up and down yeah so tell me about your qualifications what are you studying and what are you qualified uh, for at the moment? I am currently doing a PhD in medical science and I am researching about non invested brain stimulation and brain training in the CP population. And I I, I really want to make a difference and I really hope my research will make a difference and um, really help people. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So you're, you're doing, you're studying non-invasive brain stimulation did you call it yes yeah that's right what does that involve um well it involves putting something on your brain 
and stimulating it, like stimulating the brain to make it improve its function. Okay, so the aim is to stimulate the brain to improve function. Is that by, is this particular device something that sits on the outside of the head and 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 helps to, uh, for example, light up the rest of the brain or different parts of the brain that are not lighting up appropriately or not yeah. activated appropriately? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's really correct. And... Um, it, 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 it is really wonderful, you know, because technology is really helping um, with um, bridging the gap, and you know, um, um, you know, um, this particular technology is really good, like. It's really cool, and it, it 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 will make a difference in people's lives. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah. So, tell me about your situation and the condition that you live with. What is the uh, the thing that you live with every day? I, I have cerebral palsy. Which means sometimes I speak differently and I move a little bit differently. But apart from that, I I am very well independent and very capable. And yeah. Um, yeah. So is I, cerebral palsy something that you were born with? Was it as a result of your delivery during birth? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was something that I was born with. Um, it caused a complication to my brain when when I was a baby and I, 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 I don't really know what happened, but my mom told me that um, uh, after my birth, I, I turned yellow. And I, I, I got severe jaundice, which um, led to the cerebral palsy. But I, I think um, when, when I was a, a little girl, the doctor said, I would never walk or talk, but I proved them wrong. <laughs> I, I did it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. So, cerebral palsy, according to a Google search, uh, as soon as I do a Google search, um, according to the CDC in America, says that cerebral palsy is a group of disorders that affects a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. Cerebral palsy is the most common motor disability in, ch in childhood. Cerebral means to have to do with the brain. Palsy means weakness or problems using the muscles. Yeah, that's correct. Now, but I imagine that people that don't understand cerebral palsy make the assumption that you also have an intellectual disability? Um, not really. I, I don't have an intellectual disability. Like, I am very intelligent and um, I, I really like to 
push myself and really um tell people what can be done. Yeah. You definitely don't have an intellectual disability because that's not what your condition creates, does it? It creates yeah. problems with the muscles uh, and their inability to support you and maintain mm. your balance and your posture. And therefore, it's got nothing to do with intellect. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And how old are you? I am 27 years old. 27? Yeah, 27. And you went to university yes. to study. Was that after high school or how did that evolve for you, your your studies? Well, I, I, I was fortunate enough to get into biomedical science after high school. So... I studied medical science in, in like biology, physiology, chemistry, and biochemistry, neuroscience, and all those good stuff. <laughs> Which university yeah. did you attend? Uh, sorry? Which university do you attend? Um, Victoria University. Victoria University in Melbourne. Yeah, in Melbourne. Yeah. I'm going to share the email that you sent me at the beginning uh, when we first course, yeah. started to chat because it sums up a lot of the uh, challenges that you're facing and the work that you're doing to raise awareness in this space. Of course. And it says, hi, I'm Jerusa. Jerusha, a third year PhD candidate. I live with cerebral palsy. I am an ambitious person. Yet for the past three years, I have been unable to gain entry into any medical program, even though I am qualified. Medical colleges in Australia make it very hard for people like me to get accepted. I'm calling for top medical colleges in Australia, such as Notre Dame University and University of Melbourne and Deakin University, to accept applicants who live with disabilities without a graduate medical admissions test. Even with provisions of reasonable adjustments in these tests, such as dictation of answers, performing tests on a computer, and additional time and rest breaks, considerable discrimination may still exist. For example, it may be too arduous to dictate the answers or to scribe due to the lengthy manipulation of formulas, extensive drawings, and mathematical calculations. Such components are challenging to undertake mentally and then dictate to the scribe. Additionally, the GAMSAT MCAT, I imagine that's the, the type of test, may be difficult to complete on a computer because of the required problem solving involving the manipulation of equations, diagrams, and drawings, heavily required in sections one and three, which assess reasoning in humanities and reasoning in biological and physical sciences, respectively. Further, speed reading can be difficult for people with disabilities, impacting the ability to achieve a competitive score. Most medical schools accept Indigenous students without a GAMSET MCAT score. A similar incentive should be made for students with disabilities. That's such a logical explanation. I love that, right? And then you continue and you say, yes. people with disabilities are one of the most underrepresented people in the medical profession. To build a representative medical workforce, colleges must do better and establish supportive policies to protective for pr prospective students. Currently, the application process for medical colleges is quite discriminatory against students with disabilities. Instead of heavily relying on standardized tests, medical schools should take a more holistic approach and find alternative ways to assess 
and applicants merit. Even at the interview stage, research has found that medical students with visible disabilities face discrimination and are not seen as capable of the medical profession. There are many specialties a doctor with a disability can successfully practice, including radiology, dermatology, general practice, psychiatry, pathology, pediatrics, and rehabilitation medicine, and some supportive and assistive technology can bridge the gaps to help them work independently in a clinical environment. Integrating people with disabilities into the medical workforce will be transformational in reversing the negative attitudes society holds about us. Representation is so important and medical colleges have the opportunity to make a real impactful change here. And then you have a petition and you ask for uh, me to sign the petition. It's um, a link that I will share, but it's perfectly well iterated and the challenges that you're facing yeah. are very legitimate concerns and they're very legitimate concerns that you have. And I think you, you're speaking for a lot of people when you're taking on uh, this level of discrimination? Yeah, um, it, it is very challenging. It, it's been a challenging daily. It's been a very hard daily, but yeah, it's been, um, it's been really, um, transformational, and I, I think we will see changes soon, so hopefully soon. Uh, I, I, I am in a bit of, a, uh, uh, um, like a legal battle with the medical rules. You're so, in a, le a legal battle. Yeah. Okay. And so, is that ongoing uh, legal battle about your particular case, or is it just to change a law, or is it to pass a law? What's the situation with that? Um. Well, it is it, 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 uh, about my case, but hopefully it will be changed systemically as well. Um, hopefully we will see change um, across a variety of different medical schools. Um, Hopefully, um, this legal battle will um, finally bring the result that we want. So, how long have you been on this legal journey? Uh, um, it, it's been a long one. It started <laughs> in like. It started in 2020. So, okay. It's been a bit of a long one. But yeah, I, I think um, this year, I, I am taking the matter to, um, to um, federal court. Wow. And I'm trying to um, get, um, get what I want and what I think is fair. Jerusha, um, it sounds like you have got a lot of support from some amazing people already. There's a lot of people behind you helping you with that. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I 
I, I got like a lawyer, really good and keep working very hard. Although I haven't met my court lawyer yet, um, but um, we are, we are still at the very starting stage. Like we still have to lodge the complaint into the court. Um, my complaint was originally um with the Australian Human Rights Commission, but um we couldn't um resolve the issues there. At the human so now rights commission. We have to take court. Okay. So the Human Rights Commission was unable to help resolve the matter. So now you're taking no. the next step in the, the next step in the legal uh action. Yeah. Well done to you. So you're a third year PhD candidate. So how long before you finish your PhD? About two more years. Um, if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Because of COVID, mm -hmm. um, there was like a very, very big delay. Mm -hmm. So all my PSD got delayed and yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it wasn't the, it wasn't the ideal situation for me, but yeah, I, I just managed to, you know. Yeah. So there's another two years to go and you will be a a doctor. Yeah. I don't <laughs> believe it. <so> much. <laughs> it's such yeah. a great it's such a great thing to work towards and um mm. being a, a, a doctor in your field and putting so much time and effort into your studies it is the next thing is to be considered to be able to work in the field that you've spent so long studying. And it's silly that you're allowed to do all this study, uh, work towards your doctorate and become a doctor in your field, and then not be able to work in the field that you are highly qualified to work in. Yeah, uh, I am. I think that uh, I can get a job in research, but not in medicine, because I, I haven't studied medicine yet. Yeah. I've studied my PhD. But um, if if I I get into medicine, I can work as a doctor, like as a medical doctor. So 
I can. I I I thought about working in Pedra or, or in or in like by Kaisi or in like um we we have a little ten medicine but um that will um depend on the court case mm -hmm. and how it goes because I I know it sounds ridiculous, but yeah, I which part sounds ridiculous? That I I need to take the court. Ah, uh, absolutely. That is pretty ridiculous. So I I speak yeah. to a lot of stroke survivors who have neurological challenges after stroke, and some of them are physically disabled as well after the stroke, and they yeah. might struggle to be as mobile as they used to be. Uh, but I always like to remind people like that of the amazing Stephen Hawken, who was uh, somebody who had, I believe he had uh, some kind of a motor neuron disease and regardless was one of the most preeminent uh, uh, doctors or p people in his field and was world renowned and had amazing success at being uh, able to continue his work even though he was uh, so challenged and people seem to forget about amazing individuals like that yeah exactly and i i think that there are so many wonderful times that have so much superpowers and capabilities uh, and yeah, they, they have a lot of strength and, um, but um, we, we all go through challenges, no matter the person, we all go through challenges. Yeah. And, yeah, it's all about your mind. And how you live your life, and how you treat uh, others, mm -hmm. and so kind, and yes, yeah, so. Yep, I agree. You seem to have made quite an impact already on your mission. You've got quite a bit of coverage in uh, the uh, in the in the news you've got uh, uh, an interview that was done on ABC in Australia you have uh, quite a lot of uh, articles out on your story yeah. and there is seems to be some support there um, one of the things I just saw when I was searching your name was that as well as a budding neuroscientist, you're also a poet. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love writing poetry and I love writing in general. So I, I started writing poetry when I was a young girl in yeah. primary school. And I I just don't uh, like writing like think about love, think about you know grief, pain, um healing, um uh, what uh family um 
um, even just about um, um, motivation, and you know, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so, Fantastic. That's quite a broad range of different topics that you yeah, I know. write, write yeah. poetry about. So if somebody wanted to find out more about your work, your poetry, yeah. any of that stuff, are you online? Is there somewhere where they can go to to check out the poetry that you do or the work that you're doing? Um, they, they can... Um... Check me out on Instagram. I I I am very very as I keep on, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So that um they can check me out there and. They can contact me if they need any help, like yep. if they want um, mentoring or insight into that situation. Um, they can um, reach out to me, and I'm happy to provide anything to them, like any support. Yeah. They need like yeah. Fantastic. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that in the show notes, there's the links to all of your social media and uh, to your LinkedIn, for example. And I'll have a link to the change, <coughs> excuse me, to the change.org uh, link where the uh, petition resides so that people who uh, are happy to and can support uh, may may fill out the petition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is the petition no. still active? Is it still live? Yeah, definitely. It's still live and it's still um going. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just checking it now just to see if I can access it. I think... Yeah. Okay, great. It does work. It is still live. And um, at the moment, you have 4,019 signatures. Yeah. And then you're hoping to break the 5,000 signature mark. Yeah, hopefully. And therefore, it says on the website, this petition is more likely to get picked up by the local news. Yeah. So is that right? So you have 4,000 <coughs> um, 4, signatures. How long has it taken to get to 4,000? It's taken a while. It's taken like about uh, six months. Six months? Yeah. Well done. That's great work. Congratulations. Thank you. It was lovely getting to talk to you. It was awesome that you reached out to me. Thank you for doing that. And I hope I can make a small difference by raising awareness through our conversation. And um, maybe we can move that number of signatures from 4,019 to a few more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for joining us on today's episode. Please comment, like, share, and leave the show a five-star review. Every interaction with uh, the Recovery After Stroke podcast makes a massive difference to the way that the show gets treated by the algorithms on Google and all the other search engines. So any interaction would be really useful and helpful so that other people can easily find the podcast and make it possible for them to potentially connect with people that they feel at least understand them and hopefully make their life in recovery after a stroke a little better. If you're watching on YouTube, comment and subscribe. Hit the notification bell to get updates of new episodes as they become available. 
And thanks so much for being here and listening to Jerusha's story. There will be links available in the show notes. So if you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes, firstly, you'll be able to download the transcription of the entire episode so that you can read through, save it, take notes if you wish. And also what you'll be able to do is see the links to Jerusha's uh, social media and to the part where she would like people to go ahead and sign her uh, petition. So thanks so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantee and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency, or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk, and we are not responsible for any information you find there.